All right. In that case, I would like to officially call to order the Tuesday, October 19th, 2021 meeting of the Bolton Conservation Commission. And pursuant to the extension of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, this public meeting of the Town of Bolton Conservation Commission is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can access this meeting while in progress by Zoom video communications. Members of the public attending this meeting virtually will be allowed to make comments if they wish to do so during the portion of the hearing designated for public comment by telephone, cell phone, or personal computer using Zoom. Uh, and per our tradition, we will start with a roll call. Uh, I am Brian Barabee. Emily Winner. Jillian Guasanos. Rebecca Longball. First up this evening. A couple oh. just housekeeping items first. Please. Um, Guidelines for participants, we would appreciate if you would utilize the chat or raised hand function to address the board. Please remain on mute until you have been addressed by the board chair. You can also physically wave if you are not familiar with those functions. We prefer you use the chat or raise hand, but if for some reason you're having problems, you may physically wave. It will just take me a moment longer to um, see you. At that time, once you're acknowledged, you can unmute yourself or I will unmute you. And participants are required to display your first and last name for record keeping purposes, please. So if you have not done so already, please change your display name. And also we do ask that participants wait again until they're acknowledged by the board chair versus talking over either the commission or another um, applicant or participant and to address the board with your questions and comments, not other individuals at the meeting. I will hand it back over to you, Brian. All right, thank you. Uh, first up this evening, the Bolton Conservation Commission will now hear a request for a certificate of compliance for 147 Long Hill Road. Uh, Rebecca, is the applicant here or somebody representing the applicant? Uh, Maureen, Herald of Norse Environmental seems to be present. I do know um, from the applicant, we have received a letter from Maureen. We also, in response to the Horsley and Witten peer, Horsley and Witten, excuse me, peer review, and we're waiting for a surveyor to get out. And that's what part of the Norse Environmental letter stated. I have yet to receive that supplemental information, but uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sure Maureen can shed some light on that if you wish. Uh, if at all possible, Maureen, that would be great. Hi, good evening. Uh, Maureen Herald, Norse Environmental. Um, so Walter Erickson asked me to perform a site visit to go out and inspect the wetland replication area. Prior to going out, I did review um, Horsley Witten's memo on the wetland replication area. Um, basically noted the same items. Uh, a few of the shrubs had died. Um, however, the overall, I thought the wetland replication area looked great. Um, I provided a report with photographs. I um, augured in two to three different locations um, in noted hydric soils within the wetland replication area. The wetland replication area does meet um, the state requirement of 75% revegetated with uh, native plants. Um, so overall, I thought, I thought it looked great. Um, because we did have a few shrubs that died, I am recommending that the applicant plant um, 10 highbush blueberry um, just blueberries are just very, very valuable for bird and wildlife species in general. Um, and I think the main takeaway I got from the Horsley Witten review was um, they wanted more of an establishment that we do in fact meet the size criteria for the replication area. Um, now I know an as-built plan had been submitted to the commission my understanding of speaking with the applicant that it was a detailed survey of this area. I reviewed that, I agree with that. Um, 
I thought the one way we could possibly put this matter to bed is to flag the wetland replication area. That's what I recommended to the applicant. It's flagged in the field and um, we're, we're just waiting for the surveyors to go out, pick up the flags and show it on the plan. And I can open it up to the commission with any questions or concerns. Okay, thank you. No, I think I think that was a, um, a good review. Um, any other commission members have questions on what we just heard or where this stands? Rebecca, do you have any additional thoughts on this or an update from where you see it? Um, I don't other than I would certainly like to, um, I would encourage the commission to wait to issue anything until we get that information from, or the confirmation from Norse. It sounds like they're working towards that. Um, and also I would, I guess ask Maureen if it's a if it's appropriate, Mr. Chair, whether or not she is looking for sort of a confirmation from the commission for the applicant to plant the high bush blueberries that you've recommended, or is that something that you are having them do regardless? I just want to understand if there's any action the commission needs to take on that this evening. So yes, if the commission is amendable, we'd love to be able to put them in the ground. Um, the season is getting shorter and shorter by the moment. Um, if that works for the commission, I know the applicant can do that next week, this week, end of next week. What are those, um, the high blush blueberries, what are they replacing? So it was a, um, maybe five or six different shrubs that had died. I think one of them was high bush blueberry. There was some arrowwood. Um, Horsley and Witten's report also noticed, I think there was two trees that had died. Um, I don't know if the commission recalls, we actually had tried to save these trees when the wetland replication area was created. So um, we excavated around these trees damaged the roots, but we made an effort to try and save them. So it also, the high bush blueberry will also replace the trees. So I guess my, my kind of comment is that diversity with plantings is important. And we're taking, we're replacing four different species with just all high bush blueberries. So I don't know how the rest of the commission members feel about that. Um, we're replacing two trees and uh, it sounds like two or three different shrubs with all high bush blueberries and we're kind of eliminating that diversity with native plantings. Um, I don't know if we should maybe suggest like a, a even two different species is in lieu of 10 high bush blueberries. Emily, I think that's a very good approach and that's typically when I'm reviewing plans for replication areas or restoration areas or remediation areas. I know the commission likes to see it. I also like to see it. Um, so we're not stuck with a monoculture. So in the future, if something happens and we get a particular pest, it's not going to impact all of the species that are there. And it may provide other um, benefits to varying species versus just one berry producing, which is also valuable, but I would agree with you, Emily. So we're, we're perfectly amendable to that. Um, one of the reasons why we suggest attend high bush blueberries was that we could secure that particular species. You know, as the commission is aware, it's the end of the growing season. Um, a lot of shrubs be, just become unavailable. Um, so that was one of the reasons why we chose those species. If the commission is adamant on two different types of species, um, we might be limited on the second type of species we can get this time of year. Uh, maybe we can only get five high bush blueberry and we may have to plant another five at a different point. I, I, I don't know. Is there, if we were going to do that, is there a reason that we aren't replanting what was on the approved plan then and just planting what we can now and then planting again in the spring? 
I don't know if the commission has had an opportunity to go out and, and look at it. Regardless of the additional plantings, even though we did have a handful of plants die, as is right now, it meets the 75% revegetation criteria. So I just wanna make it clear that these additional species are not needed to meet that criteria. I think this is in good faith to acknowledge the fact that the two trees had uh, failed to survive as well as a handful of shrubs. Um, so in, I, I like highbush blueberry, I think it's a valuable shrub. Uh, we, again, we're certainly open to planting what the commission will like. It's just to get it in the ground this time of year will be challenging and have it survive. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may, I just want Please. to take one step back. So I understand by reviewing what's been submitted already, you are, but then you're still working to clarify that it meets the 75%. That's what you stated at the beginning of this meeting, correct? The replication as is today meets yep. the 75% wetland replication criteria that's required. Okay. Because okay. the few shrubs had died and the two trees had died in good faith, we mm -hmm. had thought, well, let's replace them. We, we can get high, 10 high bush blueberries. That's not a problem. We can put them in the ground. And um, we had thought maybe the commission would prefer that or like that. So that's sure. why we put that in the proposal for tonight's evening. And, and I appreciate that um, you mentioning that again and explaining that again. I probably phrased my question wrong. You talked about in your letter, having a surveyor go out and just confirm the flags. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, so okay. that is a confirmation that we're still waiting for regardless of these plantings, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. okay. I know that was two separate things that I tied together, I apologize. Um, Mr. Chair, I think it is very reasonable uh, for the applicant to be planting the 10 high bush blueberries. I know the commission would prefer, as Emily stated, to have, I don't think the commission is particularly um, needing to be specific on what shrub goes in there, aside from being able to survive in that environment and being a native shrub that would accompany the high bush blueberry. And I think that would give enough variability and flexibility for the applicant to choose five and five or a mixture, however they choose to split it up and give them the flexibility to work with what may be available, understanding what Maureen just stated. So with that, I think, Mr. Chair, we're waiting for more information, but in the short term, would the commission be amendable to making a motion to authorize the applicant to do these plantings? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, and and I'm just trying to find the right wording. Emily, are you, are you, are you comfortable with a 50-50 a split or the, uh, you know, a, a higher density of high bush blueberries depending on what's already kind of been established there? Just trying to think I, how to word it best. I think the high bush blueberries are a, a great um, a great planting for uh, replacing the trees that um, didn't make it. Um, and then if there were plants in the replication area that were replacing, it would be nice to have a 50-50 split. I don't know how this is being divided up, how many high bush blueberries are going, you know, where the trees were or, um, unfortunately have not been out there in a long time. So um, I don't know how many in the replication area needed to be replaced, but um, I think a 50-50 split, I think there are still some surviving plantings. And I think if we could get, you know, a 50-50 split in the replication area and then some high bush blueberries for the trees, I think that's reasonable. Okay. And Jillian, any thoughts? Any additional, or does that sound about right to you? 
I think that sounds reasonable and the diversity, it, it makes sense. Okay. So Maureen, if, if we were to say uh, it was, a, it was originally 10 high bush blueberries, if, if we say, well, you know, say two, two count towards the two trees and then, you know, a split with the remaining eight. So it could be basically six high bush blueberries and four of something else. That's like a, na a native plant or a native pollinator. Um, do you think you might be able to find somebody? Do you think that's a, that's a reasonable parameter to work within? Yes, I think that's reasonable. I think just the biggest challenge would be maybe to secure those shrubs. So um, certainly we'll make every effort to find native wetland plants. You know, if we can get winterberry, that's a dynamite plant as well. So we'll definitely make every effort to, um, you know, accommodate the commission's request. Okay, we, we, we would appreciate that. Um, and, and again, if we're, if we're short by one bush or plant uh, and we can see a good faith effort, you know, it, we, we can always go from there because I, again, it's gonna come up. We still need a few things before we can uh, issue the certificate of compliance regardless. Um, it, so in that case, I'd like to take a roll call vote to see if, if the commission approves um, letting the applicant know that, that we approve of the, the additional replication area of uh, up to six high bush blueberries and, and four other native plants or native pollinators of, of a different variety. Um, all those in favor of that, and I'll, we'll do it via roll call. I'll start with Emily. Aye. Uh, Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am an I myself. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So sh is, would it be possible to, I think, continue the hearing? Because I think what I'm hearing from the commission is we want to wait for that as-built plan showing the flagged wetland. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Rebecca, what's the, for, I, I, well, I should say our, our next public meeting is, are we into the beginning of November? Oh. Um, we are. We are on November 2nd. Okay, and do we have a uh, first open time? Um, I would say do seven, actually, let me check before. Okay. Um, and while Rebecca's checking that, be before we move to continue, I noticed there is a hand up for a question, um, and we will address that in a minute. Let me just see if we can't find the information for when we would be continuing it to. Um, I would start at 7.30. Okay. Because we do have an item. Okay. And it looks like we have a question from a member of the public. Could you admit them in to ask their question? Yes. All right, uh, Lauren Silly. Oh, there you are. You may address the board, Lauren. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Lauren Silly from 147 Long Hill Road. Um, I just wanted to ask about a couple other items that were in Amy Ball's reports that haven't haven't been addressed. Um, one being that she recommends, um, well, she recommended it, just reading from it, that the commission seek to have the applicant provide evidence that this area had been monitored during the remainder of the two, 2019 growing season and during the 2020 growing season. In the absence of this, I mean, I'm assuming they haven't provided any evidence of that. I don't think anything's been monitored. Um, it says that she recommend, or they recommend that the commission consider extending the monitoring period for at least another growing season, particularly in light of the recommendations for replacing lost plants. So I just wanted to check in on kind of where that stands if we're going through another growing season. Um, 
yeah, that was one question. And then I had two other quick questions. But. We could possibly take that one first. Re Rebecca, did you have a comment on this? I did. Okay. Um, so as you noted and heard this evening, we already have a couple more plantings that are being installed. Um, we are also waiting for the surveyed area of the wetlands to confer of the re wetland replication area to confirm the size of that. And at that time, the commission, once receiving all that information, could consider extending another season to monitor the growth. Um, as stated in the Horsley and Winton. And then additionally, we had gotten a letter back, as you saw from um, Norse Environmental. I do not have any substantial information regarding the monitoring period between um, when Amy had mentioned in her letter from Horsley Witten. Um, maybe Maureen can touch upon that or enlighten us on that. I believe there was not monitoring done. However, I do not have confirmation one way or another. So I would have to dig a little deeper in my files. I do have um, a letter from 2019 uh, made up yep. to the Bolton Conservation Commission. I don't think any monitoring was performed in 2020, although I would like to just double check that and, and verify that fact. Um, you know, again, it's going to be up to the commission and what your preference is. I, I think the area looks great. It's 75% revegetated. I am more than happy to continue another season of monitoring if that topic does get discussed at some point, but I don't feel that it's necessary. Thank you. Uh, so did you have another question? Um, so part of the order of conditions, part of all the recommendations is about keeping the silt fencing in working order, um, or, uh, you know, at least being effective. There's silt fence and stuff that's been there for, I guess, over five years now that's just completely buried. So I guess my point is that it's not being kept in good condition, and I am eager to get this thing over with and done, but I also... At this point, like, I don't even know how someone would go in and find it. It's been so buried. So I just, I want to bring that to the board's attention um, that there's work that needs to be done there to like before it could be um, kind of finished out. I also just want to remind, or maybe you weren't aware that Norse, um, this company is re the president's related to the applicant. Um, so I just, if you, take that with a grain of salt. I think that's important to remember through all this. Um, and then my final question is just because they haven't gotten the certificate of compliance, compliance because this is an ongoing issue, are they still, the applicants still responsible for um, like vacuuming out the catch basins and all that kind of stuff? Or is that the owner's responsibility now? Um, Rebecca, did you have an answer to that one? I, I think I know I the answer, but I think um, you'll have it better. Yeah. Lauren, I do appreciate you bringing up um, the potential financial interest. I think that's important and something that we typically or the commission typically likes to know right off the bat. So I do appreciate you bringing that up. Um, in this case where our peer, I mean, it's at the commission's discretion to say whether or not that's a conflict, but where we're getting essentially the same information from our peer reviewer and there's not really a disagreement or a conflict on what needs to be done. I think that speaks for itself as well, but I think it is important to just keep that and to state it on the record. So again, I do appreciate that. The silt fencing, you're absolutely correct, has not been removed because there is still work going on on site by the applicant, as you've heard this evening. However, it should be in good functioning order. I do know some of it's been um, uh, grown over essentially or buried by the growth or by maybe clippings and other things. They will have to remove that. So I would suggest you do not remove it um, and let them do that once they receive their request for certificate of compliance. And they should have it in good working, good functioning condition 
specifically where they're working within this area. Areas outside where they're not working, yes, it should still be in good condition, but where most of it's stabilized, it's not really doing anything. Typically, applicants will ask for a partial certificate of compliance to remove the areas that they have basically completed work in. So that may be the case that they had filed this hoping to remove everything, but where they're still doing a couple planting, we would, I would typically encourage the commission to make them keep it, but put it back up so it's functioning properly or install new erosion control, or remove the old. Um, then I, I think that may be it. Did I miss anything, Lauren? Just the like vacuuming out the oh, cat. Oh, like. yes. Um, thank you. So regarding the roadway, that should have been a document associated with the planning board's decision. And if it is not, I would have to re-review our the order of conditions that was issued again, just to see where that lies. But if it's not in the order of conditions and it's in the planning documents, you'd have to refer to those planning documents and any decisions issued there. Okay, yeah, I believe it's in the order of conditions. I, I mean, I, it's hard to keep it all straight, so I'm not positive what all falls under what, but I believe that was part of the order of conditions that that all stays maintained yeah. until. I can, I'll double check um, the order of conditions on that particular note. Um, just so that we're all clear on that going forward. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you to the board for your work on this. Thank May you. I just address one of the statements? Go ahead, Maureen. Um, what? So I'm a professional wetland scientist, soil scientist, certified wetland scientist in New Hampshire, botanist, have a degree in this, have been doing this for 20 years. And I want the commission to know that I wouldn't sacrifice my reputations or stamps for anyone in this business, relative to my boss or not. Um, I wanna make that perfectly clear to the commission. Um, if the commission has any questions, any hesitations, please let's schedule a site visit, let's go out, let's take a look at the area. Um, I don't appreciate the comment from the abutter regarding that or hinting around to that. So again, if the commission would like to go out, we can do a site visit and, and we can take a look. Um, Mr. Chair, may I just make a brief comment? Um, so Maureen, I do appreciate that. And I have senior credentials and I have senior work on other projects as well. So um, I don't believe it was meant personal. I don't think anyone's here to offend anyone else, but rather just there are are times when there are unfortunately, and again, not specific to this particular um, project, but there are times where there are conflicts of interest and the commission just likes to be made aware of them upfront or potential conflicts. That's simply what it is. It's not to offend anyone, but it, it's information that when it's put out there right away, it makes it a lot less it, it feels a lot less like a conflict than if it comes out later on. That's, I think that's all, and that's really the purpose of me certainly acknowledging it and saying thank you so much for bringing it up um, so that it is clear about everything that's going on, not in necessarily a negative way, but just the details of the project. That's it. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to the chair. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm probably going to make a motion to, that we continue this, but even, even prior to what was just said, I, I was considering the idea of a site visit. And the, the reason I say it is I, I know I haven't been out there in over a year. Uh, I know we have a new commission member who's probably never been out there. Um, and now that we have it on the public docket, is it something we could schedule, try to get a site visit in before, um, the next meeting? I mean, if, if members would I mean, be amenable, if, if, if Maureen, if, if that would be okay to try to absolutely. schedule, I think it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt. Like I said, I, I, I have been on site. I do know the site, but it's, it's been over a year for me. Um, and I, and I know some members haven't been out there yet. Sure. That's not a problem. My schedule okay. is flexible so I can work around the commission. 
Okay. Um, so Rebecca, if, if I could add that to your, your lovely list of things to try to coordinate for us, thank you. Of course. All right. All right. So that's, I'd like to make a, a motion that we continue the public hearing for a request for a certificate of compliance for 147 Long Hill Road till our next public hearing, uh, Tuesday, November 2nd at 7.30 PM. Uh, do I hear a second for continuing? Second. All right. All those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Uh, Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am an aye as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Maureen, we will be in touch once I coordinate with the commission members to see their availability individually. Um, and then I will coordinate with you. But in the meantime, please feel free to um, get the plantings in order so that we can review those as soon as possible. Okay, great. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. You as well. Okay. Are we ready to continue, Rebecca? Yes. Okay. So the, the Bolton Conservation Commission will uh, now hear a request for a notice of intent uh, under Mass General Law Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Bolton Bylaw Chapter 233 uh, for 580 Main Street, Map 4.C, Parcel 24, uh, an operation and maintenance of a stormwater basin within the resource area. Uh, Rebecca, is the applicant or somebody representing the applicant here this evening? Yes, they are. I believe Jeff O'Neill and Mark is here as well. Mark Div. Mm -hmm. Um, I, Scott thank Myers. You. I see. Oh, and Scott. Thank you. Right. Um, I did want to just clarify one item on the display that you have before you. So the applicant has since addressed the additional filing fees. There was some confusion with the category, but that has since been clarified. So um, there's not a need to table due to filing fees at this time. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, if you would like, the applicant can certainly provide a summary of their notice of intent, if you would like. That would be fantastic if they are ready. Hi, I am Scott Smyers. I'm sorry, but there's something wrong with my camera. It says it's on, but obviously I'm not there. So sorry about that. Um, but yes, uh, this, is, this is an unusual project that goes back many years with the uh, Bolton Conservation Commission uh, and the main objective of this is to clarify the issues regarding the drainage uh, basin in the in the southern portion of the property mostly uh, and uh, establish a uh, BMPs best management practices that can be uh, applied to the site to make sure that we have a clear understanding of where the wetland resource areas are and where the uh, uh, stormwater treatment systems are located. And in, and in this case, it's a little bit confusing because the drainage basin in the southern portion, which we call basin one, um, was originally created in, uh, based on a 1986 design that was approved by the Conservation Commission and the DEP at that time. And part of it was created as a wetland to enhance the treatment of the stormwater. Um, and at that time, that was very new, a new idea, uh, fairly cutting edge. I saw the name on that applica application was IEP, who was one of the first uh, environmental consulting, interdisciplinary environmental planning was IEP. That's what that stood for. It later turned into uh, FUGRO, then ENSER, then AECOM. Uh, so it's evolved over time. But I did actually work for Dennis Lowry, whose name was on that uh, application from way back in the 1980s. So I'm familiar with the history of that technology and planting wetlands for uh, stormwater treatment. And the confusing part comes in when it functions so well, like a wetland, that it looks like a functional wetland, like it does uh, much like today with cattails around the edge, a lot of diverse wetland plants, um, and then uh, more shrubs along the side. 
but the, the giveaway is that we went back through the uh, documents that are in the town file and we uh, were able to uh, put together all those uh, and, and tell the history, the accurate history of it, that it was created. And out in the field, you have uh, several weirs uh, along a berm that was created on the southern edge of the southern pond where it outlets. So the cement uh, that was obviously put there uh, to, to make it so it, it filled to a certain level, then it would drain out into the natural wetland and then drain around the corner into the stream uh, to the north. Um, and so uh, that was one part of the notice of intent is just to clarify that because there's been several applications, uh, 2014 and then two RDAs in 2021 uh, that uh, were sometimes referring to that as a wetland resource area, not as a, uh, a, a stormwater treatment feature that was designed to be that way. And so what we're proposing is that uh, we have uh, four uh, specific BMPs that are outlined in detail, and I'll just briefly go over them, which BMP one is basin one, the southern one, it would be mowed once or maybe up to twice a year uh, and inspected, the firm inspected. Then uh, BMP2 is to improve, um, I don't know, thank you. Uh, BMP2 is to improve the drainage off of the existing um, parking lot uh, through uh, three uh, shallow riprap swales. Right now it's sheet flow mostly coming off of that parking lot. We can uh, identify certain areas that we add the riprap to that would improve slowing down the water essentially as it travels off of the parking lot and into the uh, stormwater system, stormwater treatment system. Uh, number three is the concrete weirs that would be inspected and cleaned out as necessary. Um, and then number four is basin two, which is way to the north of the site, um, it, it, or the, the northern end of the site, I should say. And that would be similar to the other basin, which would be inspected and mowed once to twice a year and inspected. Then the other component of this application is the ongoing uh, problems with beavers, beaver dams, beaver lodges. I was out there today, there was a beaver lodge. Uh, I noticed, I think, in the in the created wetland, the stormwater treatment facility. I couldn't tell if it was occupied, but it may have been left over from uh, last year and not actually occupied now, but I'm not, it wasn't there. And then there's another uh, beaver uh, dam downstream which is to the north uh, that is uh, about two and a half, three feet high, probably holding back water. And that's important to, because it has an impact on the, drainage, the, the drainage of the whole area, that whole part of town is very flat. So every inch, every foot of water that's held up uh, where it wasn't it, over historically, it's going to impact upstream and specifically impact the functionality of the stormwater uh, basin and the treatment system in general. Uh, so we uh, propose a very specific uh, way to try to improve that, which is mainly inspect for beaver issues more frequently so that if there are dams that build up, they can get, get removed by hand without um, the need for machines and extra disturbance. Uh, but, so that means just more frequent inspections and more passive maintenance with hand tools. Uh, but if machinery is necessary, we'd certainly uh, notify the Conservation Commission, and of course the Board of Health usually is involved in these uh, issues as well. Um, and then there is a, a form that the state developed uh, years ago, the Emergency Beaver and Muskrat Permit, that is a one-page form that can be filed with the uh, Bolton Conservation Commission and the Board of Health at the same time to be, uh, so we can uh, notify them that the beaver dam <clears throat> is going to have to be removed ask, answer any questions, and then get it taken care of promptly. Um, so with uh, us, uh, the, as part, part of the project team, like you mentioned, is Jeff O'Neill and uh, the project engineer who wrote most of those uh, operation maintenance plan details. 
uh, Mark Gibb. So if you have any Thank questions, you. we're here to answer your questions and we look forward to moving forward with this. Thank you. Scott, I may, I, I would also want to add um, to the commission as well is that those two uh, BMP, those basins, BMP one and the other one we we're discussing, I think it's four. Yep. Those two basins are also fire storage capacity for fire sprinkler systems in the building. So we need access to those. They hold a certain amount of water um, and that's in backup in case there is a catastrophic event at the building. Okay. Um, any commission members have initial thoughts on what we've heard so far? Um, where I, I apologize, and I'm going to be completely honest, I have not seen these documents. Um, where where is this operations and maintenance plan, and do we have a plan that shows these different basins? So Emily, you should have received it with the packet of information when they had submitted it originally, which was probably a week or two ago, um, and with that. They did submit some plans with it, but I okay. think it would be helpful for the commission to see on site where in particular the riprap is proposed. Was um, this submitted and, prior to the 10-5 meeting? Yes. Okay. It was that's submitted fine. just prior to I'm that. Sorry. They didn't meet the deadline. Yeah. Okay. I was not at that. I, I apologize that I haven't reviewed these ahead of time. Um, but I will do that and Yes, a site visit would be fantastic. That that is all I have for comments currently. Thank you. Um, I should say, Jillian, any uh, any initial comments or thoughts? <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I think a site visit would be helpful. There was a lot of detailed explanation, but I think seeing it um, is probably best. Okay. Um, and Rebecca, did uh, any initial comments or thoughts? Um, I again, I really, I was curious about the riprap placement, um, and then the extent of mowing as well. I know they did do a wonderful job of talking about which BMP on which particular basin, but I just, I'd like to know the extent. So I don't know if that's a narrative or while we're on site during the site visit someone can describe it or mark it out to that extent so that we can, the commission can then consider it, maybe rewrite the narrative, reword the narrative a little bit. So it's a little more clear as far as the extent of what the commission would be considering to approve. Um, the other question I had was, and I'm, I'm pleased to hear what I heard this evening regarding the, the, the work related to beaver activity and associated maintenance, because in the narrative, I was um, very confused because in, I think it's one of the last portions of the narrative, it highlights all the things you've mentioned, but what it also says is that the applicant would not come back before, and maybe it was a typo, um, but would not be coming back to be requesting permission and overview by the commission again, once they receive um, the initial approval essentially for um, the beaver <clears throat> lodge removal or beaver dam breaching, or even um, the removal of the beavers was also included. So I was a little confused with that. So if that can be clarified, and if that is certainly not the case, because you would be required to come back just like you would with Board of Health to have that permit filed. Um, and if it's maintaining going forward, the commission has certainly seen that the initial breach requires that. And then if it's just keeping an eye on it, so every time one small stick is placed, it's removed. I could see that being a different story for the commission to consider, but if it's an extent of it's being built back up where a different beaver comes in to then um, claim the area, that would certainly require an additional permit. 
Um, I understand it may seem redundant, redundant, excuse me, to the applicant, but that is what's typically required. Um, additionally, I, when I was reading through the BMP for that maintenance, again, related to the reduce the beaver activity or the impacts from beaver activity, it was curious to me that I did not see any mention of a, or a consideration for a flow device. And that's something that we read, readily use throughout not only our conservation properties, but through some of our municipal um, rights of way and municipal properties that seem to work fairly well. And we've had success with them, but that's something I think I'd like to understand a little bit or for the commission to maybe think about, is this site um, something that would support flow device so it would actually reduce the overall long-term maintenance and then reduce costs associated with that for the applicant or as we know there are some sites that are that just simply don't suit that infrastructure well but I can't I can't speak to that so you'd have to hire someone who specializes in it to make that assessment but that's something again that we typically see that works well and it keeps the levels where they're functional and not impacting the stormwater infrastructure while allowing for that wildlife to basically survive in that area and coexist. Okay. Um so basically from what I'm hearing, it's, it sounds like a number of people, myself included, would like to see a, a site visit um, just to kind of reacquaint ourselves and see exactly how this is going to flow. I can follow it on the plans, but it would be nice to see it in the field. Um, and it would, it would also give us a chance to review some of these, uh, some of the OMPs with um, uh, keeping in mind some of the things we've heard tonight. Um, I should ask Rebecca, is there, are there any members of the public here tonight to comment on this? Again, you can use the raise hand function or the chat function or physically wave. And I see no one. Okay. So that said, if, if the applicants are amenable, um, would it be possible for us to continue, continue this till our next hearing? Um, and in the interim, try to get out for a site visit. I'll be fine. Perfect. All right. In that case, I'd like to make a motion um, that we continue the public hearing for a notice of intent for 580 Main Street, map 4.C, parcel 24, until our next public meeting, uh, Tuesday, November 2nd at 7.45 p.m. Uh, do I hear a second for that? Second. All right. Um, all those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am and I myself. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Jeff, Mark, and Scott, I will be following up with you once I coordinate with the commission members their availability to hopefully schedule a site visit. Would you like to be present at the site visit? I believe that would be best, or at least a representative to express what BMPs are going with. <clears throat> yes, we'll be present. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Have a Thank good you night. very much. Night. Okay. Next up on this evening's agenda, we have a vote scheduled, uh, for the notice of intent for Furbush Mill Road at 5.8-17. Um, if you remember, this was the one we had at our last public hearing. We kind of went through all of our questions with the state and what we were looking to have added to the conditions. Um, we closed the hearing, so we're not taking additional comment tonight to give us a chance to draft everything. Um, and then we'll be voting on it now. So that said, uh, do anybody have any questions with it as it was drafted or have any issues with the draft? I didn't have any questions. Okay. Um, in that case, I'd like to make a motion. Um, oh, I, I should ask quickly, Rebecca, is there any, there was, there was nothing I really, because it's an NOI, there are no conditions to add, if I am correct, it is just accepting it as drafted and submitted? Um, for the conditions, yes, 
um, and just going through the findings mm -hmm. and then just naming the final plans. But yes, so certainly it can be the conditions as drafted with special conditions, including the findings associated with 112, 700, which I will put in, I see a typo already. Um, and the final plans referenced here as well. And I can, if you wanna just touch upon some of where it says the commission finds the following, I can certainly move the screen as necessary, but just so that we read that into the record. I, I think you're right. I'm sorry, I, I, I almost skipped past that. Uh, in, in that case, um, if I can begin, um, as part of our general findings for this uh, notice of intent, the commission finds the following, um, that immediate mitigation is necessary to address outstanding items stated within the emergency certificate, the certification issued to the department, uh, to DCAMM on April 3rd of 2020 with specified conditions and work description document. The, exist, the existing conditions plan submitted as figure two, existing conditions and appendix C, depicting accurate information, specifically bank, bordering vegetated wetland, land underwater uh, bodies and waterways, isolated vegetated wetland, riverfront area, 100 foot buffer zone, adjacent upland resource area, uh, covered by local bylaw, and a 25 foot exclusion zone, again, covered by the local bylaw. Um, the requested variance from the 25 foot exclusion zone specific to access requirements to the footprint of disturbance for construction activities within the 25 foot exclusion zone is necessary. Approximately 7,647 square feet of the 25 foot exclusion zone is located within the footprint of temporary or permanent disturbance for construction. Um, if you, yeah. Uh, for for construction activities, this disturbance and this disturbance and alteration shall be minimized to the maximum extent practicable during construction. The construction of the interim auxiliary spillway shall not change the normal pond elevation and shall continue to control the elevation at 333.7 feet NAVD 88. The commission finds the proposed work shall not include the trapping or euthanasia of beavers. The site manager and property owner shall be responsible for receiving proper permitting from the Board of Health and the Conservation Commission prior to any work that would alter, disturb, or remove a beaver, associated dam or lodge, and or other related infrastructure, which shall require an emergency permit from either regulatory authority. The temporary coffer dam, a, a temporary coffer dam shall be provided if needed at the upstream end of the spillway in the event of high pond elevations during construction to prevent flow through the auxiliary spillway prior to completion. The removal of the existing downstream conduit shall be performed in the dry. Uh, temporary coffer dam shall be placed across the stream channel upstream and downstream of the conduit during the work at that location to restrict flow through the work area. A gravity bypass pipe and or pump shall be used to divert water around the work area so as to maintain flow through the spillway channel and into the natural stream channel. Leakage and groundwater shall be handled via a sump pump within each work area. The repairs to the access road shall be limited to the existing alignment and footprint of the road and shall focus on areas where erosion has occurred. Repairs to the access road shall focus on the areas around the downstream spillway conduit and the access road culvert, which cross the access road. Repairs shall include backfilling of the excavations for the downstream spillway conduit and the road culvert to the grade shown on the project plans. Restoration of the roadway subbase beyond the excavation areas in places where erosion has resulted in ruts or gullies and placement of up to six inches of new gravel surfacing on the roadway within the existing limits of the road width of 12 feet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Post-construction restoration shall be necessary. Um, any damage to areas caused by construction equipment access or caused by the project shall be restored and regraded to provide for firm surface with good drainage as to preclude the channeling of water or migration of material into resource areas beyond the limit of work. 
the existing culvert under the existing access road shall be removed through the use of an excavator working from the roadway and the existing pipe shall be lawfully disposed of off-site. The commission finds the applicant shall provide documentation of the lawful disposal site. The existing 15 inch clay culvert shall be replaced with an eight foot wide by four foot high precast reinforced concrete box culvert, which has been designed to conform with the guidelines of the Massachusetts Stream Crossing Manual, which require that the width of new stream crossings be 1.2 times the bank fill width of the stream with a natural bottom material. The culvert shall be backfilled with approximately um, two feet of sand and gravel material, leaving two feet of headspace for water passage. Existing upstream and downstream transition slopes shall be stabilized with 12 inch riprap. Sand gravel bedding shall be provided below the culvert and the remaining excavation shall be backfilled with compacted on-site material. The culvert shall be capable of passing the estimated 25 year flood peak, flood peak flow rate without access road overtopping. Gravel road surface shall be provided along the existing access road alignment above the culvert. The culvert work, including the removal of the existing culvert shall be performed in the dry. Temporary coffer dams shall, shall be placed across the stream channel upstream and downstream of the culvert during the work at the location to restrict flow through the work area. A gravity bypass pipe and or pump shall be used to divert water around the work area so as to maintain flow in the stream. Leakage and groundwater will be handled via a sump pump within each work area. Additional water control shall be necessary as detailed in plans and supplemental information provided by GZA as part of this filing. The commission finds that although the existing multiple undersized culverts not meeting stream crossing standards under Furbush Mill Road are no greater than 10 inches in diameter and are beyond the project area and are not owned by DCAMM and no modifications to, those, to these culverts are proposed. The applicant shall ensure, based upon their evaluation, no further degradation or, or adverse impacts to the infrastructure be incurred during construction, nor shall this occur post-construction. Mitigation work shall include, but not be limited to manual removal of sediment uh, deposition into resource areas that have uh, occurred due to large storm events at the direction of the wetland scientist. Disturbed areas shall be restored using a native seed mix and weed-free straw. Regarding climate resilience and adaptation, the commission finds that this project will result in improvements to the hydraulic capacity of the dam and the stream by the addition uh, of the interim auxil auxiliary spill well and the enlargement of the downstream culvert. Climate change in, New England, in the New England region is anticipated to result in more frequent, higher intensity rainfall in the future. The improvements to hydraulic capacity will be protective of the access road and surrounding wetland resource areas. The project will allow flows generated by higher intensity rainstorms to be re retained within the spillway and stream channels. This shall reduce potential erosion, erosion and sedimentation of the surrounding wetland resource areas which could otherwise result from overland runoff down the high gradient overbanks and across the access road. The proposed project shall improve climate resiliency along the unnamed tributary to Still River along Furbush Mill Road. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and if you would like, I just wanted to stop you there because the rest are our boilerplate. I was, we're getting yes. into our regular. Um, so with that, if the commission would like to consider um, the issuing or your decision on the order of conditions as drafted and with the findings as you had just stated, and then just referencing these final plans, I think that would encompass the vote necessary. Sure, and then I'd like to make a motion that we vote to accept or uh, yeah, to issue an order of conditions for the uh, notice of intent for Fourbridge Mill Road, map 5.A-117. Um, 
as drafted and submitted at this evening's meeting um, and noting that the final plans, the interim auxiliary spillway and brook crossings repair swimming pool dam in Bolton, Massachusetts, prepared for Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance dated September 2021, signed and stamped October 14th, 2021 by civil engineer Derek J. Shipper, um, be accepted um, as, as our final plans drafted and submitted this evening. I think I just threw a lot of word salad in to say, uh, accepting these revised and final plans that we have and are showing at this evening's meeting. Um, do, do I hear a second for issuing an order of conditions um, as drafted and submitted with the final plan information that I had just kind of read? Second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Uh, Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am an aye as well. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Um, to those present for this particular item, I did want to just state that the we will fill in like you saw that blank where it said 112700. Um, I will get the online DEP order conditions and the commission will sign those. Technically the commission has 21 days to issue um, as I'm sure you're familiar with. And typically they do not take that full time period, but when they, the document is signed, I will reach out to you and notify you of that along with, if you could email me and provide me with the contact to whom you would like included on the EDEP issuance of the order of conditions as well, that would be appreciated so that once it is issued and we receive all the signatures, you will get that electronic copy immediately once again we receive those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I, I, if thank I may, you. I, I just Please. wanted to um, thank you for um, uh, sharing with us the, the draft uh, so we had the opportunity to see that and we appreciate the vote tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Rebecca, are you ready to move on? Yes. Okay. All right. The Bolton Conservation Commission will now continue uh, the public hearing under Mass General Law Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Bolton Bylaw Chapter 233 to consider a request for determination of applicability for two wheeler road, uh, the removal of the possible removal of some trees. Um, do Rebecca, I, I'm not sure if the applicants here tonight, or if, if we have an update on this one, I know we, we had set up a site visit to go out to, uh, I have to admit, I was not able to attend this site visit. I am sorry to say, um, and I'm not sure if anybody who was able to attend the site visit can give an update. I was able to go, um, update, you know, it's, it's behind their, their house, um, in between the house and an easement to uh, an easement driveway back to some houses. Um, there. By the way, I, I am here. This is this is Kyle, the applicant. Are you? Um, there seem to be four pretty large pine trees um, that they're looking to remove. Three smaller. They look like deciduous trees. Don't know what kind. And then there was half of a mulberry. There's, there's a mulberry tree that half of a large branch um, or limb is leaning over towards the house. Um, the, the only question that I had um, was what would be there after the trees were removed? Um, if there was any plans for any landscaping or if it was just to be left to naturalize or if any other shrubs were to be planted. Kyle, yeah, I was gonna say, would you like to answer that? Well, I don't have any plans at the moment. Um, that is an area that's right near the house. So we do kind of take care of it. 
um, don't let it go too crazy. Right now it's in near full shade, so not too much grows down there except for, you know, low little low bushes and such, low plants. And Rebecca, I, I'm I'm trying to look at the the picture, but remind me is is the buffer zone is the driveway, the easement driveway between the buffer zone and the tree. It goes yeah. so like it kind of has a, a bit of a natural barrier before you get to the resource area, or well it has yes. the yep. <laughs> so this here, if you can see my cursor, is the wetland line. Yep. Here's your 25 foot, and then you have the hundred which has been annotated on it. So the trees are within the hundred. There is the driveway between. Um, and so you are correct, Brian. Okay. Um, and I did, did you have a chance to go to the site? Did you have thoughts on this site? Um, I did not have a chance to go out with the um, site visit that was scheduled, but um, I did look at some aerial photos just to try to get a better sense of the site itself. I think if the commission were to approve removal of these trees, that it would certainly be mindful to be planting some sort of a native shrub or other woody vegetation to allow for that area to still sustain the same performance standard. So that's what, what the commission is tasked with, to ensure that the performance standard is still continued. Um, and I think it still will, specifically with that driveway easement, again, that area closer to the actual wetland resource area itself is protected because of that easement. But as we know, that 100 foot or additional 75 foot area is still a resource area. So it has its own set of performance standards um, where it's not currently lawn, I think the applicant may have the ability to allow it to um, naturalize versus plant something else, but I think it would also be completely reasonable for the commission to um, request or require the applicant to again plant some sort of uh, woody shrub or woody vegetation, whether it be trees to replace the function that was there or again some sort of native species that would provide a similar function. Um, other commission members have thoughts on that? I think it would be a good idea. And I, Brian, I also was not able to make that site visit. Um, but I do think that it would be nice to just see some native shrubs. And then as Rebecca stated, have allow the area to naturalize. Um, but it would nice it would be nice to have a couple, you know, a few plantings added um, with the removal of the trees, of course, native shrubs. Um, just gonna leave that there. <laughs> um, Jillian, does that make sense to you based, based on what you saw out there? And, and Kyle, I, I wanna ask you about it too, but <clears throat> yep. was, it, was there a clear yeah. delineation of where we could, you know, where, it would be best to allow it to naturalize for us what's going to be removed. I... Yeah, it's pretty naturalized around <clears throat> the trees, right? There's no, there's no lawn there or anything. Um, it's, it's always nice though to, you know, nature will fill it in, but if we can fill it in with some great plants, there may be some pollinators or some natural plantings. That's great too. Um, so, and now that there will be more sunlight in that area, given that the trees will be gone, there might be opportunity for some other things to to grow and I was gonna ask, go ahead kyle well i just say so yeah i'd be happy to plant native shrubs i don't know how to select them or, or where to get them but um sure okay i'm going to say that there are some great uh resources locally um there's garden in the woods in framingham um there is uh the Nursery in Northborough has some native plants, not all. They also have non-native plants, so they do have a native section. Um, and then there are some great resources online um, for uh, selecting or just for identifying native plants. 
Um, there is uh, Dr. Grieger is a native pollinator. Uh, uh, he has great lists for native pollinators, um, but there are, if you just perform like an online search uh, for the, make, make sure it's for this area because there will be native plant lists for all, all across the, the country. So um, there should be some good ones. And I think we were just looking for some shrubs anyway. And then if you wanted to add in native plants as well, that's amazing. Um, but it sounds like Jillian said that the, the area is pretty naturalized already. So if we just had some kind of native shrubs to kind of bring back that wooded, wooded um, feel, I think that would be beneficial. Sounds good. I right. do want to just note to the commission as well. Um, we do want to touch upon the question of sump grinding or not, or leaving things as um, snags or not. I just wanted to throw that out there for the commission. Yeah, I, 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 um, it's a very good question. And Kyle, I don't know if you had um, play when you're when you're talking tree removal, you're talking tree and stump, or basically just the tree down to the stump. Well, I'm I'm open to that. I mean, my 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 experience as a layman is that if you don't take the stump out and comes back, um, I don't want them to grow back because that would be defeat the purpose, which is to shade, uh, you know, remove the shade, although granted that would take years, but trees do grow fast. I mean, I guess I would, I'd be open either way. Um, it's obviously more expensive to grind this, the, the stumps out. I don't know, you probably prefer to leave them in, right? Generally speaking, if we can in buffer zones, um, it's great. And again, it is it's generally less cost to you to, to be able to leave them there. So if I, if we left um, would it be okay for me to trim them back when they grow? Because they, yeah. will, they will grow, at least some of them. Right, right. Yeah, if, if they try to reestablish to, to be able to trim them, I yeah. think that would be fine. I think we could put that in the condition too, I think. Okay. All right. Um, so what was the total number of trees to be removed? So there was... There was um, three um, pretty sizable pine trees. Um, I wrote it down in the application, maybe it was four, I forget. And then between it, there was just a bunch of smaller deciduous trees, maybe about seven, but they were just sort of, you know, like an inch wide in diameter. And then there was, uh, I think it was more like a third of the mulberry tree. The big mulberry tree has, has three main trunks and one of them is, is kind of dying anyway. So. I would say it's three or four pines, a bunch of smaller ones, and then that mulberry third or half. And were they were they marked on site, Jillian? The the trees to be removed, or were they pointed out? I'm trying to look back at my pictures. Um, I think the pine were the pine trees, Kyle. Were they? They were red ribbons. To... They were yep, red so ribbons. So I see around, that around the smaller the ones. ones I, yeah, the smaller ones I don't see. Um, flagged, but the larger pines are, are flagged. Okay. And, and the mulberry. I was going to suggest, Brian, potentially as a condition, you could have the applicant stake out the limit of work or tie ribbons around all of them prior, um, but where if there's a lot of small diameter deciduous trees, it, it may be an excessive amount of work versus just staking out um, an area to be just reviewed prior to removal. If I, if I may, the, the pine trees kind of enclose all of the little ones. So the area is like really obvious. There's one pine tree on the sort of top left there and then there's the other ones down at the bottom. So that's really the area. The little trees are just the ones inside it. Okay. Okay. Um, um, any other comments by commission members? All right, Rebecca, anybody from the public here tonight to comment on this? I see no one. Okay. That said, I'm, I'm gonna make a motion to 
close um, the hearing for a request for determination of applicability for two Wheeler Road. Do, do I hear a second for closing? Second. All right. All those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am an I myself. Okay. I think I'd like, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we have a that we have a negative three determination for the request for determination of applicability for two wheeler road um, with the following conditions um, that the trees to be removed represent the three pines and mulberry that were flagged in the field and smaller trees located within the perimeter of the trees that were marked. Um, that the stumps will be left from the for, for the, the stumps will be left from these cuttings, uh, but the applicant can maintain um, that these trees, these specific trees that are cut, do not grow in the future by trimming or uh, control growth. Um, that the area where the trees currently reside be allowed to naturalize in the future going forward, um, and that. A mitigation of uh, and and uh, feel free to check me on this one, but um, a mitigation of that's three plus Jason uh, in the resource area. What's that? Are you talking about the resource area? No, I, I was trying to. Uh, I, the one thing I didn't have a note or note down was uh, the number of shrubbery for mitigation oh, as oh. far as native shrubs or plantings. Um, gotcha. Uh, and uh, uh, Jillian or Emily, any thoughts based on the amount of trees coming out? You know, usually we do need to give a number. We say five native shrubs, four native shrubs, six, you know. Um, I, I was thinking like three to four. I mean, it, th we're taking out three pines and it sounds like a lot of really young uh, hardwoods. So he, I think Kyle mentioned it, they were an inch in diameter and Jillian can confirm that. But um. I mean, I, I think three is reasonable. If 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 Kyle, if the applicant would like to do more, that's wonderful. Um, but it sounds like the area will also naturalize on its own, and things will come up. So I think it's just kind of more of like a woody buffer, um, and just to kind of keep that uh, that character, as Rebecca had mentioned, um, as it should be, the soil and everything. So. I don't know, Jillian, if you, if that sounds good to you, three, three or four. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say four. So three to four is good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, and so the additional condition um, that the, the applicant will uh, help to mitigate the area by the replanting of no less than three uh, native shrubs or plants of similar uh, um, heft. Um. Are there any conditions I am forgetting? So I just went through this. Okay. So with those conditions, do I hear a, sec a second for a negative three determination with the conditions I just proposed? Second. Okay. All those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Uh, Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am an I myself. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Kyle, once those that determination is signed by the commission, I will be mailing you a copy. Okay. And that will, so basically the mailing date is the official issuance date. So after you receive that, there is a 10 day appeal period for um, DEP and any aggrieved abutters where we have heard no comments this evening. I doubt that will be an issue. Um, but then you are able to start the work after that. Okay, is there a time period by which I must have the work done by? For example, if I, if, could I do it next spring? If it turned yes. out that this, okay. Yeah, so your determination is good for three years. So Perfect. just simply providing an update if you're not doing it in the near future would be beneficial for the commission just so that we're ensured that this work either took place or it did not um, and how it is going. Okay. Perfect. 
Thank you very much, everybody. Thank All right, you. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Okay, moving on. Uh, the Bolton Conservation Commission will now continue the public hearing uh, under Mass General Law Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Bolton Bylaw Chapter 233 um, to consider a notice of intent for Meadow Road Lots 7 and 8, Map 4. Point D, Parcel 101, a uh, shared driveway grading and associated drainage. Um, do we have an update on this project or is somebody here to update this evening? We do, Brian. Uh, Ryan Proctor here from Dillis and Roy, representing the applicant, uh, the Wilsons. Okay. Um, Re Rebecca, would it be possible to share my screen, please? Yes, if you bear with me for just one moment. Sure. Thank you. Do you have the option now? I do, and okay. it looks like we're going. Uh, can everyone see my screen here, the plan? Yes. Okay, um, so I just, I very briefly wanted to go over the plan. This is, what we're looking at here is the originally submitted uh, plan with our notice of intent that we had gone over when we were before you guys um, about four weeks ago. Um, so originally this is lot seven here to the right, um, lot eight here. This is the wetland resource area um, that the filing was based on, and of course, Meadow Road here. What we had originally proposed is a shared driveway coming straight off Meadow Road um, with almost an immediate split with a portion of the driveway heading off towards lot seven, and a portion of the driveway heading off towards lot eight. Um, a majority of the grading and the work proposed within the buffer zone originally was this driveway for lot eight. And at the first meeting, there was some, um, some concern relative to the amount of work and grading that was uh, within the 100 foot buffer zone, um, pursuing mostly to this driveway for lot eight as that was the majority of the work proposed. Um, so we were asked to look at alternatives and I'm gonna pull up the revised plan here. So based on some comments received at the original meeting um, and working with the applicant, and kind of relaying things out, uh, we decided to shift the driveway entrance to the east, a little further away from the buffer zone, which is this dark line here. We kept the shared drive, uh, shared portion of the driveway much longer, um, getting uphill before splitting. And we pushed the houses further uphill, again, more um, increasing the distance between the proposed houses and the wetland resource area. So the only work that we are proposing with inside the 100 foot buffer zone now with this revised layout is this little section of driveway grading. Um, and then we do have, similar to before, we have these um, mini basins on either side of the driveway to um, help catch some of the runoff from the driveway before and prevent it from getting onto Meadow Road. Um, so just this little portion right here is what we're proposing with inside the buffer zone now. All the work that was originally proposed over here is no longer going to happen. The only thing I will note, uh, this grading here, as uh, Jack Maloney from our office said in the first meeting, this is what we'll call ghost grading. Um, it's for the reserve septic system, which is not going to be built as part of um, this development at this time. So this grading is for the future if the septic, um, septic system needed any replacement. Um, but that's, so that's shown just schematically for down the road. Um, and an all grading that's going to happen as part of this development um, is outside of the 100 foot buffer zone. And I believe uh, Brian and Emily read the sidewalk along with Rebecca, but everything that was staked out that we saw in the field was, um, it was it was this layout, this revised driveway layout, the systems were staked out and we, looked, we saw the houses up on the hill as well. Um, I believe that's all, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, um, I, I will say, you know, uh, uh, our usual tactic of trying to avoid and minimize uh, um, hitting the wetlands and the wetland buffer zones. You, you did a pretty good job of it on this one, uh, trying to pull the majority of it out. Um, I think these plans are a lot better than the original ones. Um, the only thing I, I guess I would still have a question with is it, it, it's there's clearly an old farm dump on site, um, not uncommon around the Bolton area. Um, 
are there any is there anything in the plans dealing with basically the dump area that's on site whether it be removing how, how deep do we get into the removing just we find sometimes this does affect resource areas um depending on what happens with basically the the dump site that was there definitely so brian this um if you can still see my screen here, this area um, we were proposing the driveway for lot eight, I believe, is that area that we saw out in the field. Um, so cool. I would in, I would anticipate that um, there will be some removal of that, um, you know, in, in accordance with um, if there's any hazardous material to be disposed of in normal way, you know, in accordance with mass general law and 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 both in regulations. So I, I would anticipate that they take that out since it's going to be part of their backyard. I'd have to clarify that with the client, but. Um, I can say with reasonable confidence, they probably don't want that next to the driveway. Yeah, well, it, I, I worry that sometimes it just gets buried or used as part of fill. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'd like to see it removed, removed from site. Okay. Um, but I, well, let me open it and see if there's, are there other questions right now from commission members? All right. Rebecca, do you have any uh, additional thoughts on this? The only additional thoughts I have are um, one being just a note to ensure that you get prior approval from the Department of Public Works because those, um, the drainage area along the toe of the slope by the driveway is actually, it looks like it's being proposed within the public right of way. So just making sure that's a typical condition that we have that you have to seek all prior approvals as well but just to note um, that will need to be addressed. Additionally, uh, I think my primary concern with the, I know we're calling it a farm dump, which is probably what it is, but without having confirmation <laughs> or details about what's in it, my concern would be related to Brian's, if that material is not removed from site and it's used elsewhere, it could potentially impact the resource area or jurisdictional areas. So I think it would be important for the commission to consider a condition, even though it's outside of a hundred feet from the wetland resource area, it has the potential to impact the resource area. So I think a condition that to the extent of just documenting where that is disposed of and to ensure that it is disposed of properly I know at times receipts are requested or required regarding earth removal and I think for material being removed and I think that would be an acceptable addition. Um, if, I, if I may, uh, Jack from Dillis and Roy, I, I think that's um, uh, acceptable on our behalf, Rebecca, that because, um, you know, people that are putting up some sizable houses out here, I'm assuming. So they, that would be the last thing that they'd want to see in there, you know, between the two houses is, you know, some old stoves and refrigerators and whatnot. So, uh, and you have a valid point in regards to, you know, if this were to be sold to a contractor, you know, what's not to stop them from just digging a hole. So, I mean, if the commission wants to put that into, uh, you know, a, a condition, I don't see that there's any, big deal with that i think that's you know it's going to be removed one way or another i would assume so um you know i just i don't want to see it you know stuck in some hole somewhere and then buried and be somebody else's problem down the road so i don't i don't have any issue with that and then my only other item i just sorry pop back in my head related to um the drive where where it enters on to Meadow Road, I know it's a relatively steep slope there now, and I was curious, there's no um, retaining walls necessary as part of this proposal, correct? So no, no retaining walls. We do have um, a boulder wall here, um, a little bit less, uh, less formal and less intimidating than the regular, it's gonna look more natural, more like stone wall, um, just to kind of capture it and kind of take the curse off of some of that steep grading uh, right by the road. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Uh, Rebecca, any members of the public here tonight to comment on this particular project? Okay. 
I see no one. Okay. Um, in that case, if, uh, any members of the commission have any final thoughts, questions, comments? In that case, I'm going to make a motion that we close the public hearing for Meadow Road lots seven and eight. Uh, do I hear a second for closing? Second. All right. All those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am and I myself. Um, Rebecca, I am looking for wording help, if possible, uh, regarding the condition of removing not so much the trash dump, um, but it, it's basically the commission's looking to receive documentation regarding removal of trash on site. Uh, I would. Um, I would say a condition to for the the applicant shall provide receipt and documentation of lawfully removed debris or material from site as referenced during the site visit as a farm dump or on site as a farm dump um, i'm just trying to think how to highlight that area yeah um, Is there a particular elevation or line of topography that that item is on that the commission might be able to reference, Ryan? Yes, so I could give you contour elevations. Is that, is that what you're looking for? Yeah, so the, the existing, not the proposed. So existing, I'd say 345 wraps around the base up to about 356. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I will attempt this. Um, like to make a motion that we um, issue an order of conditions for Meadow Road, Lot 7 and 8, as drafted and submitted at this evening's meeting with the following condition that the applicant shall provide uh, receipts and or documentation of lawfully remo removed refuse on site, specifically uh, items that have been referred to as possible farm dump it, at previous meetings and tonight's meeting. Uh, most, of this in, most of this refuse located approximately between the three, 345 and the 356 contour lines on the map provided at this evening's meeting. Uh, do I hear a second for issuing with those conditions? Second. All right. All those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Uh, Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am and I myself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you've probably heard me say before, the commission has 21 days to issue, um, meaning that's the mailing date once they've all signed. However, if you would like to send me whomever email, whomever's email you would like me to send the electronic copy to, it will automatically be sent via EDEP once that document is issued. You will be receiving a hard copy as well. So if you can send me a mailing address and you can do this via email, you don't need to give it to me at this moment, but that would be helpful. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Okay, next up, the uh, Bolton Conservation Commission will now continue the public hearing under Mass General Law Chapter 131. Section 40 and the Bolton Bylaw Chapter 233 to consider a request for determination of applicability for 304 Still River Road, the extension of fencing along the Western Parcel Line. Um, I, I should ask if, if the applicant or somebody representing the applicant is here tonight. 
or um, if we have any updates on this, I will say uh, this is another one. I am sad to say I was not able to make the site visit. Uh, this was a bad week for me. Um, so I'd be curious to hear an update if anybody who was able to attend or Rebecca, if you're able to provide an update as well. So I was able to um, visit the site. Um, there is currently a chain link fence um, on the um, edge of the property and pretty straightforward. They're looking to put a cedar fence in front of it, barricade, eight foot barricade cedar fence. Um, I believe, and if the applicant can correct me if, if this is wrong, that there's going to be you know, concrete footings um, placed um, for each post. Um, and it stops before the shed. So it doesn't, doesn't go beyond the shed and the shed's not going to move. Okay. There's no trees um, or anything in that path. Right now it's just lawn. Right. Um. So uh, I was going to say, Jillian, I hate to rely so much on you because I, I, I can't picture the site as well. Um, yeah. you, it, it sounds like it's going over existing lawn uh, other than the fence posts themselves. There's nothing really permanent going there. <clears throat> um, yeah. I guess usually the one question we would have based on where it's kind of going is just the, um, the ability for wildlife to kind of commute through that area. Um, so there's a pool back okay. there. Yeah. So it's already all secured with fencing. So um, right before, I don't know if that pink line is probably a good indication, like right under the 104 is yeah. probably the, probably where the area of the front facing fence is. It's a picket, I think it's a picket fence with a gate. Um, and then it abuts the chain link fence that goes along the side of the, the property and the neighbors on this side. So it's on the inside of what's already a fenced in backyard and secure. It's just for privacy purposes was my understanding because um, there's a clear view from the neighbor's property right to the swimming pool. I got you. Yeah. Okay. Um, it doesn't sound like you really have any issues with it as it's being proposed, just seeing what you saw there on site. Yeah, there was no trees. There was nothing being moved. There was, you know, it wasn't um, putting up a fence where there wasn't one. It's kind of doubling a fence. The only thing they're leaving enough room, it seems like, between the chain link and the the proposed cedar fence that so they can get back there to mow. So they're not even proposing to put any gravel or anything there. It's just going to be at as it is today, was my understanding. Okay. I didn't realize it was, there was another fence already there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think I have any real additional questions. Emily, any thoughts, concerns, questions regarding this? I, um, given that there is an existing fence there and the chain link, um, I, my, my first concern was that I know we have blending turtles in this area. Um, and I can see, I'm trying to look at the hatch and I tried to look at this before. Um, it does, I think it is priority habitat. So I'm guessing we have some blanding turtles and migration there. Um, and that would have been my main concern is like you said, Brian, that we are disrupting their migration and you know movement for laying eggs and, and things. But given that there is this fence already, I really can't see any issue with putting a fence there or putting it in front of the chain link fence for privacy. But we're not we're not really changing the conditions at this point. So, all right, uh, Rebecca, do do you have any thoughts? Um, and and one thing I guess I, I'm I'm I'd, I'd like to gauge from you. I, I was trying to think if it's if it is a negative determination. Um, are there any conditions we would look to add or would this be closer to a negative five, seeing how there's already a fence in place and it's going over existing yard 
it's basically just a privacy fence rather than any type of new barrier going up. Yeah, I would lean more more towards a negative five because it's over existing lawn. It's not further altering an area that is directly inside of the adjacent upland resource area or the bordering vegetated wetland itself or the no disturb area. So with that, I think it does meet that negative five unless there was something that the commission was concerned about related to the concrete footings. But again, um, if it's already adjacent to an area that's fenced in and outside of those areas, not subject to impact them, I think negative five is reasonable. Okay. Um, and, and I should ask yeah, any members of the public here to comment on this this evening. Nope. All right. In that case, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, close the public hearing for a request for determination of applicability for 304 Still River Road. Uh, do I hear a second for closing? Second. All right. All those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am and I myself. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then I would like to make a motion that we have a negative five determination for the request for determination of applicability for 304 Still River Road. Um, do I hear a second for that motion? Second. All right. All those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am and I as well. Great. All right. Um, at, uh, the Bolton Conservation Commission will now continue the public meet, uh, public hearing under Mass General Law Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Bolton Bylaw Chapter 233 uh, to consider a notice of intent filed for Century Mill Road Map 3.D, Parcel 75. Um, Notice via my screen that the applicant, and I was going to say, Rebecca, in Forbes earlier today, the applicant's uh, representative has requested a continuation uh, to allow their arborist to coordinate. Well, no, the, 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 to be a the response from the site visit. Yeah, the arborists were able to conduct. Um, they are doing, they are, um, I believe, going kind of back and forth with the engineers right now. Um, so there was a continuation requested. I see no reason why not to. Uh, Continue it um, unless any uh, commission member has strong feelings. <clears throat> All right, um, Rebecca, is it still? Uh, I think seven forty-five was the last thing I had on November second. So yep. this, so this eight o'clock. Okay. All right. In that case, I'd like to make a motion that we continue the uh, public hearing for a notice of intent for Century Mill Road Map Three Point D Parcel Seventy-Five until our next public hearing, uh, Tuesday, November 2nd at eight o'clock PM. Do I hear a second for continuing? Sorry. Second. All right, all those in favor starting with Emily? Aye. Uh, Jillian? Aye. And Rebecca, I am an I as well. Wonderful. Uh, did commission members have a chance to look through the uh, October 5th meeting minutes that Rebecca had sent around? And if so, were there any questions, problems, additions, subtractions? Hearing none, um, I would like to make a motion that we approve the minutes for our October 5th, 2021 meeting as drafted and submitted at this evening's meeting. Do I hear a second for that? Second. All right, all those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am an I for that as well. Perfect. Um, we do have a couple representatives of the local trails committee and a specific initiative group who would like to provide a brief summary and just informal initial presentation regarding the Bolton Trail Safety and Connectivity Initiative 
inclusive of some equestrian usage. And I know Cindy is here to provide that, Mr. Chair, if you would like her to. That would be excellent, Cindy, if you could do that. Okay, great. Thank you for having me. I'd like to also mention that two other folks are on the phone. We have Emily Hatch, who is another horse farm owner from Bolton. I am also a horse farm owner from Bolton. And then we also have Bob Hatch, who is a multiple decade resident horse owner of Bolton, also an engineer, project manager, um, horse farm owner, and currently the president of the Open Space Committee in Hubbardton, also a trail bridge expert. So I'd like to give you a, an overview of what we've been working on. Um, this project started based on two things, um, shared frustration from Bolton horse owners about our ability to use the trails and also an accident that happened to um, another Bolton resident when her horse slipped off a bridge that had no curbs and um, ended her uh, getting med flighted and uh, still recovering to this day. Once we started researching the trails and documenting everything and talking to everybody, we realized it's really not just an equestrian issue. Um, we have a problem in our town with bridges on the trails. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And um, so here's the problem statement. Um, in Bolton, as we all know, we have amazing conservation areas throughout our town, beautiful trails. However, we have a problem with our bridges. Uh, the bridges are narrow, they're slippery, they're broken. There's no curbs or railings. Um, we've walked on the trails at all times of the year. Um, the pressure treated wood and the decking tends to be made slippery by green gunk like algae. In the winter, they're slippery. Um, so horses just simply can't get through unless you live near the west side of Rattlesnake. Um, and people can get through. However, some of these bridges are, are just not even safe for people. Um, so horse owners are a huge friend of trails and conservation. If you look at towns like Hamilton, Lincoln, uh, Sherborne, Carlisle, those are towns with extensive open space and a lot of connectivity and the, and the common theme there is that there are horse owners in those towns that are involved and willing to participate. And that is um, who we are for this town. So here are some pictures. I think you've probably seen these. This we found out the barge connector is actually in Harvard. So I'm uh, discussing with them about what to do there. Um, the beavers recently moved in, well, maybe not that recently, I moved here 20 years ago, I was able to get around many of these places, uh, and now I can't. Um, there's been many bridges put up. Um, here's an example of some of the green gunk on this bridge and anymore is really slippery, um, they're broken. Um, there's a lot of these bog bridges. Um, and you can see here, this bridge in Rattlesnake, this is actually the only safe bridge in our town for horses. Here are some more examples of, um, now this bridge here, it's, it looks fairly solid. However, it's extremely slippery, lacking curves. Um, so we've documented all the bridges. We've categorized them. I've spoken with horse owners all over the town to figure out where they ride where they can get through, where they can't get through. This is some examples of the bridges in Vaughn Hills. So as you can see, this is just not an equestrian problem. This is a, a, a people safety problem as well. Um, so this, this boardwalk here in Vinger is um, also unsafe for people. Um, so after having researched and categorized all of the bridges, spoken with various people around the town, including other horse owners. Um, this is the status of our plan. And we're now at the point where we'd like to seek approval from you for our bridge pilot. Um, 
So when I first documented all of these bridges and tried to find a solution, I really struggled to find any expert that could advise me on what we needed to do. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Emily and Bob. Emily, um, as I mentioned, is another horse farm owner. And um, Bob is the owner of Burnshire Hills. And he also worked for the company called um, Bedford Fiberglass Reinforced Plastics. Um, that's the solution that we're going to be talking about and recommending. Um, there are many bridges in Bolton that need to be replaced. So this is going to have to be a multi-phase project. What we'd like to do is start with a pilot. Um, this pilot, we're not asking for any funding from the town. The intention is to self-fund these first five crossings. And then I believe in November, the mass trail grant application um, process starts then I will be requesting um, funding for additional bridges as we go via the Mass Trails Grant Program. So our next step is to obtain approval from this commission to proceed with our pilot. Then at that point, we will complete the final site visits with Bob, make the measurements, finalize the costs, and then we'll implement the solution. And then, as I mentioned, apply for the grants for the remaining bridges. Well, in Vaughn Hills, we've identified the fact that there are eight bridges in Vaughn Hills and um, they're all in need of repair or replacement. What we've done is identify the four most important. And so those are going to be the four. This one is clearly in need of replacement. This one is at the Beaver Pond. There's, uh, this bridge is extremely slippery and narrow. We have this bog bridge here and you can see that the traffic just bypasses it. Um, this culvert recently washed out. So we'd like to propose a solution there. And then this is another narrow slippery bridge that's critical for connectivity in Vaughn Hills. This is a boardwalk in Vinger, um, which is critical for connectivity. And it's, it's not safe for people, and it's also not passable for horses. So these are the, the five pilot bridges. And I've got a map here of Vaughn Hills showing where each bridge is. So these four bridges, if we're able to fix those, we can enable um, a loop around Vaughn Hills. And these other ones will be replaced in the next phase. This finger boardwalk is also critical for folks living down on Berlin Road because they're currently isolated and unable to get up to areas like um, Randall, um, like Pool Dwight. There's another critical area that we also need to address, which is up in Annie Moore. Uh, there's a horse farm owner up there who abuts all those trails and can't access them. So the overview of our plan is two parts. Number one, stream crossings. We are against the use of pressure treated wood, uh, number one, because it's slippery, number two, because of the chemicals. We're also against the use of decking, although it lasts longer, it's extremely um, slippery. So we're going to propose FRP structures, and um, Bob can provide more details about those if you have questions. These are, this is a solution that has a 75 year lifespan, at least 400. This will uh, take care of many generations to come. And it's not only the structure itself, but the, the surface of the structure is going to be non-slip made out of geo, with geotextile and pea gravel um, on it. So that there's no way anyone can slip on these bridges, not a horse, not a person, not a mountain bike, they'll be safe. Now, we also have an issue in our town with a lot of wet trails you know, due to the beavers, we do have a lot of streams. Right now, we do have um, a lot of these um, bog bridges, which aren't really satisfactory for anybody. So we'd like to propose using a solution called Triax, and it's environmentally friendly. Um, it's much safer for the earth than the, um, than the pressure treated wood. And I have a few pictures to show you of how it works. It's basically like a snowshoe for the ground um, and it holds the ground together so that the ground is safe to walk on without having to have a bunch of boardwalks and, and bridges. 
So this is the first um, bridge that we'd like to propose. This Bond Hill stream crossing, this is probably the worst in our town. Um, and we'd like to propose um, um, a five foot wide span here. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but these are the specifications and the costs. And you know, it's wet. If you go past it, it's wet up here. So we would like to recommend some triacs for that trail because it's not really a wetland, it's just kind of a wet trail that, that we'd like to protect, keep it from getting damaged and make it safe to walk on. The second one is this Moen culvert. This is an important place to get through. And uh, right now it needs repair. We'd like to propose a similar kind of a crossing here. Then this, this Moen bridge, actually for those of you that know this area, before this, there's actually kind of like a raised bog bridge that's part of the solution. Um, we're proposing handrails on the areas where if you as a walker or if you with your dog or you with your horse fell off, you could be hurt by what's below. So we're, pro we're proposing railings in the areas where it's a, a steep fall or there could be rocks below. The beaver pond I mentioned earlier, this is too slippery. So what we'd like to do is replace this with a um, FOP bridge with curbs. This one doesn't need railings and with a, a, a P-stone surface, as I mentioned. This area here would be a good candidate for triax. We want to re remove this bog bridge. Um, this does get wet at certain times of the year. This is the Vinger Marsh Crossing. And what we'd like, like to discuss and propose here, which may require a separate discussion, is this crossing, if we were to put in a, a boardwalk here, like a segmented marsh crossing, it's very long. It would actually cost about $20,000. What we noticed is if you go a little bit west of this um, area, about 100 feet, it's clear on both sides. There's a um, an ideal spot for a crossing. And it, we could build a bridge there for probably $4,000 or less. Here's some information about triax. It's basically trail stabilization. As I mentioned, it's an environmentally friendly solution. This is a picture um, that, of a project that Bob implemented where um, a very wet trail was stabilized using this um, modern solution. You can use uh, faceted stone with it and you can have that washed also. You can put then pea stone on top of it or you can also use stump grindings. I'm not sure if you had a chance to review the presentation in advance, but I, I do have some pictures of projects that um, Bob has also completed in here. But conservation commissions around Massachusetts are starting to accept and embrace the use of this project, this product including Broughton, Hubbardston, and Miller's Falls. Here are some pictures. You can see this is a wet, mucky area. You can see afterwards, it's just a beautiful, natural looking trail. You can also work around uh, stumps. So, so for example, if there are stumps or trees, you don't have to remove those. Here is a picture of the bridge technology that we're talking about here. Um, it wouldn't have this surface shown here. It would have this grid. The grid is what um, we use to hold the keystone, which is our non-slip non -slip solution. Here's an example. This is a, a bridge being retrofitted for this kind of solution. It was a slippery wooden bridge. Um, it's a matter of putting down uh, the geotextile, the keystone, and then this is a, a non-slip safe bridge that anyone can cross. And it's pretty easy to install, as you can see here, it was less than two hours for, for two people. So that was just a brief overview of about maybe two years or a year and a half of work on behalf of, of our team. Do you have any questions that we can answer? So I, I do want to just note to the commission, I see a few of them going to unmute, which I think it's relevant to ask the questions. I will say any of these would require a wetland filing, which I know Cindy, we had touched about, touched upon before. 
but I just want to remind the commission members of that as well. So right now it's just a mission, initial informal Q and A trying to figure out more about this. I have a question just about the bridges in general. Um, are they, uh, are they built on site or you had showed a picture of one built in a warehouse. Um, are they brought in already assembled or would they be assembled on site in place? Um, you, I, if you want to get into more details about this, you can either assemble it yourself or you can have it assembled for you for a, a slight additional cost. We were leaning towards having it pre-assembled for us because we wanted to have it factory assembled by experts. Then we would just have to carry it into the site. Bob, do you have anything to add on that? What was that? Oh, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything about um, the fact that we were thinking of getting the bridges pre-assembled. The, uh, the, the FRP, uh, uh, structures uh, are easy to assemble on site, uh, but they can be pre-assembled and for the vast majority of them, uh, and if you're talking in a, a, a six, eight, 10, 12 foot uh, crossing situation, uh, those could be carried in uh, already assembled, except if they have a hand railing. So if the particular crossing that you have requires a hand railing, uh, that would just be attached after the uh, crossing structure was put in place. Okay. I don't have any uh, other questions. I, I think this is a wonderful idea. Um, and I think it's a huge benefit to our conservation areas. And I also feel that um, that we should, you know, aside from being safer for, for people and dogs, um, I think that it's great that, that you're willing to, um, make trails safer for horseback riding. Um, I, so. I, I'd like to comment on that because that was a, a great segue to, uh, as, uh, Cynthia, as Cindy said, the, uh, uh, I'm chair of the open space committee in Hubbison. Uh, we have several bridges in the Hubbison State Forest, and the, the initial concern that was expressed was not equestrian. It was simple people uh, using the trails walking, and the, uh, as Cindy said, the, the, the surface gets so slippery due, uh, due to a fine algae film that gets uh, uh, deposited on them, uh, particularly in the fall where the temperatures are cooler and the moisture level just increases a little bit, the surface is like grease. Um, and it isn't just the algae situation. Um, I was just on a ride through Brooks Woodland Preserve in Petersham and there were just leaves deposited on a bridge the uh and and oh to put a little bit more detail in this uh there was one other bridge in brooks woodland that was notably slippery and we put a this non uh slip surface on it which is a, a geotextile slash p-stone surface uh, uh, two or three years ago, and that's been fine. The, the bridge that we just crossed was typically high and dry uh, out in the sunlight, but during this part of the season, uh, there were some leaves on it, and under the leaves was a little bit of moisture. The first two horses crossed the bridge easily. The third horse crossing uh, happened to step right in the middle of a, a, a leaf patch, both front feet went out from underneath it and uh, the horse went down, the rider went down and fortunately, neither were seriously injured. Uh, I personally am on a, a mission to try and alleviate these kinds of situations. They're, they can be literally lethal 
as Cindy pointed out, relative to uh, other accidents that have happened. And it isn't just, uh, these happen to be equestrian, but it isn't just equestrian. The, uh, the, there's no need for this. There are, there are simple solutions. And I've done, oh, hundreds of hours of research trying to resolve these situations. And the uh, using FRP with a combination of the uh, HTP fabric and P-Stone, any bridge can be made safe for walkers, uh, hikers, bikers, equestrian, et cetera. And it's uh, it just, oh, it's, it's mind boggling to me why this continues when there's such an easy and environmentally sound uh, approach to solving the problem. Yeah, it wasn't so simple until we until we met Bob and started working with him, and then, uh, that's when the answers became apparent. So it's it's definitely been a team effort. Are there any other questions regarding our our proposal? Our I have a few actually. Um, ongoing maintenance. Um, are these insured? If somebody breaks one of those hand railings, do we then have to pay to fix it? Um, and you know, it, it says a seventy-five year lifespan. I get that, but you know, if it's if it's fifty years, am I setting up the next generation to now have to have a larger conservation budget for bridge maintenance? Because these some of these are kind of substantial bridges as to you know, and I can see safer. Um, I just worry about ongoing maintenance concerns, uh, replacement. Um, do we then need to carry insurance? Again, once we've built a bridge with railings, if one of the railings breaks, then I, I think we have to shut it down and fix it right away, right? Insurance wise. I guess that that's one of my questions about just ongoing maintenance, um, what that might cost the town. The, the, uh, I'll jump in front of Cindy on this one. The, uh, sure. the, the ongoing maintenance. Uh, what are your alternatives? You got, uh, we, we've uh, implemented uh, alternatives where the uh, surface is pressed to treated wood that we have subsequently resolved with fabric and P-stone. Uh, but that lifespan of that uh, underlying uh, material is still in the 15 year time frame. The, uh, the handrails are still out of wood. The handrails in these things are going to be FRP. Uh, could there be a, a major incident that could uh, knock that over? Possibly. Uh, is that uh, it would be much more highly likely that be a problem with a wooden structure versus an FRP structure. So uh, might something happen? Yeah. Would you have to put less into an FRP ver uh, solution versus a wooden solution? Absolutely. So if, if you're going to resolve your water crossing situations, the uh, using something that is going to last much longer, be much safer, uh, have a, a, a surface that uh, is going to require essentially uh, zero maintenance. Uh, what, where's the decision here? Um, I, I also had a question about pea gravel migration. Um, and, and I, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, some people are jerks. They'll just go kick those pea, you know, kids will go and just kick those pea stones into the stream or, you know, migrate down the trails. Is there anything that really stops pea stone migration? Yes, there's a, there's a uh, little border on the side. The, uh, this, this pea stone solution, um, I'll, I'll take a little credit here. Because I've been studying this stuff for years, uh, looking at uh, paint with a uh, grit installed and all kinds of other different types of solutions. 
Uh, Becky Gallagher, president of Bay State Trail Riders Association, looked into something called black rubber. Uh, uh, and we made a presentation. We made a joint presentation at Mass Trails Conference uh, two years ago. Uh, and the, the absolute proposed solution was this fabric and P-stone. The, the P-stone surface only wants to be, uh, th there's not going to be materials kicked off of this. We've got, uh, if people want to observe some of these things, we've got these uh, installed in the Hubbardson State Forest uh, within easy access of a road, so you don't have to walk two miles to get into it. Um, uh, Becky Gallagher has now uh, had these installed in oh, five or six locations uh, in different state forests uh, down in the Webster area. Uh, the, uh, the material, there has not been one incident of uh, a material incident, uh, a maintenance incident for the uh, solutions we have uh, put into our trails in uh, the three years they've been in uh, existence. In fact, when we first installed them, the, uh, when we walked them, there was, they were a little bit too squishy. You know, if you put in a, a half, three quarters of an inch of uh, pea stone, uh, you, when you walk on it, it's uh, a little bit squishy. So we actually removed material. The, the, the intent, what happens, the, 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 the solution, the, the geotextile material, GT116, is about a quarter inch thick, uh, high density polyethylene fabric. And what happens is all you want to do is coat that with a uh, quarter to three eighths of an inch of material. And those pe the pea stone gets embedded into it. So it's almost like a, a paint solution, except the material to, re to achieve a, a gritty su surface is to allow the pea stone to be embedded into the HDPE fabric. And it's, uh, we've had hikers, bikers, equestrians cross these bridges hundreds and hundreds of times. And we've done nothing to, to maintain that because it doesn't go away. And the, and the fabric that we're talking about is extremely porous. The pea stone is obviously porous. So it does nothing to deteriorate. If you have an existing bridge, it does nothing to deteriorate the, the wooden surface below it. Uh, uh, everything is porous. So the water just uh, uh, dissipates through it. So leaves, frost, ice, etc., do nothing to uh, uh, diminish the, the safe surface that anybody Horse, human, bike, it's can use to traverse the bridge. We've had. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll expand. I'm the. the oh, that's. The, I, th I think you've. This is a passion for me. Pretty well. I I get. Uh, I get that it is. But no, I'm going to um, make one more comment. We've we've had people from New Hampshire, New Jersey, and other states trying uh, contacted us to. Uh, get details on how we have addressed this solution. Right. Um, I, I think those are my initial questions on this. Um, other commission members have any questions? And Rebecca, do you have any initial questions, thoughts, comments? I, I did. I think it's wonderful. And I do want to acknowledge the amount of work and effort and research that's gone into um, these presentations and the purpose, along with exactly everything that you've presented this evening. Um, I've relayed at trails committee meetings where this was presented. Some of the material that I think was the, called the triax over wet areas. I think that could certainly be implemented on some of our properties. However, um, not through wetland resource areas. And that 
again, would need some further clarification and site specific, but if it's a wetland resource area, that's filling a wetland and that should not be implemented in that area. However, for instance, I know you brought up Annie Moore, there is an area up gradient on the Annie Moore conservation area that does get wet seasonally. It's not a vernal pool, um, it's just where the water runs across and putting something, something that's a pervious material may assist that trail in particular. So that's just one location off the top of my head. Um, as far as Vaughn Hills, I'm going to use that as an example just because you had as well. I think certainly there are some crossings that could be improved to accommodate equestrian traffic, which would also accommodate some of our all other users that aren't advertised for use on the property, but it's not a prohibited use either. For instance, mountain bikers, again, equestrians, um, or people hiking or walking the trail. None of our trails are advertised or showcased as being a particular user group. All trails are pedestrian traffic, foot traffic. Um, and the reason why I highlight that is because as we're looking to improve our crossings and bridges, again, I think it's mindful to improve some so that we can accommodate a particular user group in addition to all of our user groups and the purpose of that property being for conservation purposes and to allow access and public access of that. Um, my concern is that there are some areas within Vaughn Hills that are either too narrow or relatively sensitive to be putting in significant crossings, or for instance, there are some loops that could accommodate one or two crossings to ensure that there's a trail that, as we know, there are issues getting in and out of four different user groups to accommodate that. I think that's completely reasonable. But I think there are other areas of Vaughn Hills, in particular, I'm thinking around the beaver pond that actually wouldn't accommodate, for instance, equestrian traffic because of the ledge outcrops, the steepness, and the trail easement. So that's something as we're looking at where to place these sort of the bigger landscape, look at one, is there a conservation restriction that doesn't allow this to be installed or is the easement not large enough to accommodate such a structure? Um, something else that I heard you touch upon is a retrofit. So using that geotextile and P-stone, I think that would be excellent. But also to Brian's point, looking at maybe some other materials that the town could more easily acquire when there is a need for a repair. And again, I bring these things up not to provide a negative outlook for this, because again, I think there are a couple locations, for instance, you pointed out the culvert crossing that has since become an issue and a couple more that could essentially create a loop and accommodate those type of crossings. Something that we brought up in the past as well is that new bridges going forward, we are going to be using um, the bumpers or the borders that help that slipping issue. Now, again, we typically create bridges for pedestrians, typically they're not high, but to your note, there are some that do cross relatively high areas. Um, but again, those are just my thoughts and comments. I think this is a wonderful initiative. I think there are some areas that could certainly be improved and could definitely accommodate utilizing the geotextile and P-stone approach. I am cautious again about the triacs in certain areas. And I am also cautious about the um, reinforced fiberglass material. If I'm referencing that properly, or if I'm not, I apologize. But um, one, being on a conservation property and two, that maintenance costs long-term, I understand it's unlikely to be a reoccurring cost, but just like a culvert, and I'm comparing it, I know those are extremes, but culverts last 60 years. And when they fail, it's a significant cost to replace or repair them. 
So when we're introducing new material to conservation properties, to Brian's point, we want to ensure that we're able to provide the replacement and maintain it going forward to accommodate these users that we're trying to ensure have access to these properties. And just keeping that in mind, I think, again, there are specific locations that can utilize this type of an approach, but I think we need to just be mindful of, of the resource areas there and be mindful of the bigger picture of making sure there's either a loop for these users to get through to, or um, that there is a comfortable out and back that can accommodate this um, different types of traffic. But overall, I think it's a great idea. I know that was long-winded, but those were my comments. Well, I, I, I'd like to address a couple of things that if I can recall a few of them. You said uh, materials uh, uh, accessibility. Uh, any of the materials that I've mentioned, the, the aren't well known to the vast majority of the public, but they are readily accessible and will continue to be readily accessible. All of these materials weren't uh, developed for the applications we're talking about here. They were developed for large scale uh, highway industrial, et cetera, applications. Uh, through the research that I have done, it's just these can be readily adapted to trail solutions. Just, uh, just uh, Cindy put up that thing that we did on Malone Road, uh, in which I have done in, in several other applications. I'm, uh, I'm about to do uh, an installation using the triax uh, in Millis Falls. We just got the final approval on that and the funding is available out there. We're gonna be starting that project in November. And uh, there's a well, approximately five, 600 foot trail that we're gonna be putting this material down on that if you walked on it, you'd be up uh, above your ankles walking through muck. There is not, it is not a wetland area. The uh, Conservation Commission has already approved this. Uh, mm -hmm. And well, the, the, the solution, and we have done videos of this. Go ahead. I, the, I appreciate uh, all that information. And, and I was, um, I did attend the trails committee meeting where you presented that. I have no doubt that this functions the way you have described. And I, I don't mean to question that at all. Um, and I'm, I'm not questioning that. What I'm simply just well, relaying for the commission's purpose is just, just noting the difference of where these things can be placed, where they shouldn't be placed to make yeah, sure that it's in compliance with our bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act, but also noting this is, again, an informal Q&A and it will have to become a filing anyway. And at that time, the commission can sort of dig through more, but I was just simply sharing just okay. my thoughts and, um, First, sort of comment. Okay. I, I appreciate okay. that, but you questioned the availability of the materials. These materials mm -hmm. are extremely available. So, if there is any maintenance issue, uh, if you relative to the ongoing maintenance, uh, you've got what do you get out there now? You've got uh, you've uh, you've you've got uh, pressure-treated wood and mm -hmm. railings and stuff. Uh, the, the maintenance on those things is far exceeds the, the maintenance that we required for the solutions that uh, Cindy's proposed first year. So. Okay. I just want to point out, you, you asked about what the town's responsibility would be for repairing things in the future if it broke. I didn't think that the town was responsible at all for these trail bridges. I mean, given, given, given the current state, that's why we thought that it would be good for having a group come and take responsibility. And if we can get, like I mentioned, horse owners love to be able to enjoy nature and ride on the trails. And if you can get a good group, they will step up and like they have in all these other towns that I mentioned, you know, take responsibility because in order for us to make the trails safe for everybody, they have to be, if they're safe for horses, they're, they're safe for everybody. 
Uh, I'll make one uh, uh, last comment. Please, uh, please. And we are starting to run into a time crunch. So all right, I'll, please, I'll, make this, I'll make this quick. The, uh, all those pictures that Cindy put up there are, are crossings that kind of invite people to use them. What's the potential of somebody being injured on the kinds of structures that you have got out there currently? End of story. Okay. Um, is there any members of the public uh, still with us this evening that want to comment or have questions? Okay. I see none. All right, seeing none. Um, I want to thank you all for the presentation. I think it was excellent. Um, I think it's wonderful that you're taking this initiative um, and I look forward to seeing what's proposed in the future. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think Bolton's at a, a crossing now to decide what Bolton's future will be as far as preserving our open space and our farms. And as I mentioned, a key aspect to that is inclusivity of horse owners who are probably the biggest proponent of trails. So hopefully we can be still involved and have horse owners in this town for years to come. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Do you mind just unsharing your screen? Oh, no, I was just oh. trying to figure out how to do that, actually, for some reason. Good night, folks. There you go. Thank you. Good night, Em. Thank you. Good night. Ryan, do you want me to just run through the last couple items? Yeah. If if okay. oh um actually we do have a vote, don't we? Oh yes. Um, yep, do sorry. you want to give a, a quick rundown? I think I think commission members will understand on what you're proposing there. Um yes, let me. Um, so regarding the consideration by the commission, I would ask that you consider to authorize your agent, which is currently me and hopefully will be <laughs> for a while, um, to review and when appropriate, approve requests from organizations or persons to film on conservation land. That's the request. The background, the brief background to that request is we've received in the past couple months at least three requests to film on conservation land. At times there's clarification needed as to whether it's trust or town owned land. However, um, we do want to be mindful of the timeline of these things happening and being improved. So similar to an authorization that was done prior to my time, the commission authorized its agent to review and authorize the removal of up to one to three trees if they meet certain criteria being dead, dying, decaying. Um, so with this, what I would ask if it's a straightforward, minimal incursion on the conservation property, no alteration proposed, um, those are the type of things that I would ask that the commission authorize me to be able to review and approve. But of course, Brian had mentioned this um, earlier to me when we were reviewing the agenda, that certainly larger projects that would take multiple days within one of our conservation areas, that would be something that would still come before the Conservation Commission and the Conservation Commission would still need to sign off. So this is more for minimal time frame or minimal impact um, filming projects. Does that make sense to the other commission members? Um, and I will say, Rebecca and I had a brief conversation too that, you know, if we ever got to the point where it was uh, more of a commercial filming or a larger commercial filming, we could look at fee structures as other communities do. But we're really not at that point right now. Um, and for some of these smaller asks, I think it just makes a lot of our lives a lot easier if she's able to, she, she generally has a, a better knowledge base on what people are asking anyways. Um, so I am tempted to go ahead and vote to grant her that authority, um, but I'm curious if, if either of you have any uh, strong thoughts in favor or against. Okay. All right. In that case, I'd, I'd like to uh, call for a roll call vote that the commission empower our conservation um, and authorize her or him uh, 
to review when appropriate and approve requests from organizations or persons uh, requesting to film on conservation land. Um, all those in favor uh, respond by saying aye, and I'll start with Emily. Aye. Um, Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am an aye as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and to Brian's point, in the future, either at our next or the following meeting after that, depending on our timing on the agenda, um, I will be just having a draft document associated with language and asking specific information so that it's a very easy, when people come up with this proposal, I can send them that document and they know exactly what we're going to be expecting of them regarding information. Um, and then I can send that on to the commission as well. But for now, I will send you that draft prior to one of our next meetings. Um, would you like me to run through the updates now? I would say I would greatly appreciate that if you were. Okay. Um, there is going to be a new story walk installed at Bower Springs Conservation Area this time. And this will be installed by the first weekend in November. Um, we are hoping to host a story walk reading by the author as well. She has very kindly donated not only her time, but also the book, which was inspired by Bower Springs and the wildlife that inhabit the area. So that is exciting. Um, the Still River Trail, this is again across the Taggart Forest Land parcel that was acquired not so long ago. I will be leading a guided walk on Thursday. So this Thursday, October 21st, starting at 9 a.m. Parking is located a walk down the roadway at Forbish Mill Field at the bottom of the transfer station or um, along Forbish Mill Road. But I ask that individuals park so as to not um, impede on traffic flow along Forbush Mill Road. Uh, the master plan subcommittee steering committee had met on Sunday. I heard there was an excellent turnout and some feedback that we may be hearing about in the near future. Um, that was more of just a reminder for individuals who were reviewing our agenda over the weekend to put in their minds that this other large plan that incorporates our work as well is going on on Sunday. We have the Nashua River Communities Resilient Land Management Project going on under our MVP program. And there will be some outreach associated with that that I will be sending along. And last but not least, we still have our volunteer land steward position open. For all inquiries, individuals can email me or call my work number there. And I believe that is the last update. Okay, well yes. stated. Um, any uh, new business, any commission members have any new business? Humorous anecdotes about life in Bolton? Hearing none, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we hereby adjourn our uh, um, Tuesday, October 19th, 2021 meeting of the Bolton Conservation Commission. Do I hear a second for adjourning? Second. All right, all those in favor, starting with Emily. Aye. Jillian. Aye. And Rebecca, I am an I as well. Good night, everyone. Wonderful, thank you so much. Good night. Take Good care. Night.